to say. You ready for me? Okay. Um, I had announced that I was going to be teaching and we were going to begin a study in the Gospel of John and I decided to change, I prayed a little bit about it because of the pastor's teaching on the life of Christ. He's been quite a bit in the book of John. There's a lot in John concerning that. So I thought maybe it might be a little, not that, there, not that it's ever redundant. I have uh, had the privilege of uh, preaching and teaching for a lot of years. I used to remember when I used to sometimes do the, the Sunday uh, morning messages at another church, and a friend of mine would do the evening church, uh, the evening messages, and he would say, he'd say something like, you know, Brother Bruce, you know, he just, he, he just talked about the same thing I was going to talk about today, but you know something? That evening message was such a blessing. They weren't redundant. They weren't anything like that. But I determined that what we might want to do is spend a little bit of time, uh, maybe a few weeks or who knows how long the Lord may show us and lead in that direction, uh, that, to look at some, um, uh, some, some Bible doctrine or, or some Bible themes, to look at the really foundational things that we really should understand as a child of God here this morning. We really should have a good understanding of how we interpret the Word of God and what the Word of God is. And also what, those, what the true doctrines are in, in that gospel. So this is going to be a little different. It's going to be more of a topographical type of teaching this morning, which uh, I don't do a lot of. Normally I like systematic, but we'll, we'll start like that. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, it is pr truly a privilege to have a place to come to open your word here this morning. And Father, to be with those of like precious play, play, uh, faith. We thank you for a place that we can be set aside from the world. And, Father, a time that we can really uh, focus upon the things that, Father, honor and glorify you. Father, we ask you in this message here this morning that all that's said here this morning would honor and glorify you, Lord, in every way. I thank you for each one you brought out this morning. I, I, I just ask you to meet their needs according to your riches as well. And I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. You know, if I was going to build a building or any building that's built, most of us know that it really requires a very solid foundation, doesn't it? How important is a foundation? I don't care how well I can build that, how well I build the building on top of that foundation. If I don't start with a solid foundation that is completely sure and is free from defect and is not corrupted in any way, because if it's corrupted in any way at any point, then it's going to fail, isn't it? And when it fails, no matter what is built on top of that, it's going to be very dangerous, and it's probably not going to last. So what we want to consider, Bible doctrine is so important in understanding, I believe, the Word of God. Throughout the Word of God, and certainly in the New Testament, there's a continuous emphasis upon sound doctrine. You know, the doctrines are, 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 are principles and truths that are, that are taught in the Scripture. And if we look at 2 Timothy 2.15, well, the Word of God tells us most of these verses we'll be talking about this morning, most of us, most of us are familiar with, but I believe they can be a big, a big help to us. But we want to remember the Word of God tells us, it says, when, when talking to Timothy, Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. You see, it's real important, the Word of God, and it's important that we understand that we first of all need to really study the Word, to rightly be approved of God. And it understand that these are the only things that are going to cause us not to become ashamed because we, because we don't know what we're talking about in a sense. We need to understand that. We need to, we, we need to, uh, uh, to be a workman that need not be ashamed. And then we must rightly divide it. Jesus goes on to say concerning the word in Matthew 5, 18, he says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now this is our Lord's words, and I think this is really important, because what he's saying here has to do with how we interpret Scripture. We don't interpret Scripture in a general sense of what we think it's saying, or just in some of the part, parts are inspired and other parts aren't. The Bible tells us, and Jesus Christ says specifically, that every jot, every tittle is the Word of God. So it's important that we understand that all of it, every part of it, every word is all, is all about the Lord. I mean, it, it, it's all God's Word. And so we want to keep that in mind. We also see the dangers of not really not knowing doctrine. The Bible warns us about this. 
If we look, for example, in Ephesians uh, uh, 4, 14, we're going to see how, how anyone, even someone who's very sincere, can be tossed to and fro for, for wrong reasons, for just, just not really understanding the word, what word of God. Ephesians 4, 14 says, that we henceforth be no more children. Notice the children here has to do with not so much that we're young or small or five years old or eight years old. But what it really has to do with is maturity. We'd be basically not, uh, not, not immature because it says, We henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Oh, can you see the dangers that the Word of God is warning us about here this morning? Do you believe that there's danger? It's talking about things of how when we're not properly prepared, we're not properly taught, when we're not properly feeding ourselves upon the Word of God, how easily we can be deceived and the dangers of that and that there are men that are out to deceive. Cunning craftiness. These are men that can be in pulpits and everything else and they lie in wait to deceive. The Bible has many warnings against false teachers and false doctrines that are being taught. So it's important that we understand that we need a firm foundation upon these things. Thus we see how well, I think many well, well-meaning believers have been drawn into false and apostate religions. For example, we can look at the charismatics. You know, the charismatics, I personally believe there's probably many charismatics that are saved because we know it's not about a church. You're not saved because you're a Baptist here this morning or because you're a Methodist, or because you're a Catholic, or whatever else, you're saved because of an individual and personal relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ, aren't you? That's what's important. But a church and the teacher should be sound as well. Problems are with things like the charismatic teaching, for example, they depend on how they feel. It's more about feelings, it's more about emotion, and it's more about how they're seeking out signs to to, to understand. Can you understand how dangerous that is? For someone in that religion that says, you know, I can't, I can't speak in tongues. I can't speak in tongues, so there must be, I, must not be, I must not be saved. They're looking for these things. They're trusting on how they feel, whether they feel saved or, or don't feel saved. And then, of course, in other camps, there's those that are just simply trusting in their own good works. They're just looking to themselves, and, and they're looking to that I'm better than so-and-so, and I don't steal, and I don't, and I don't, uh, I don't I, I'm, not, uh, I'm fair with people. I do all these wonderful things. So, therefore, I'm saved because I'm a good person. And these are dangerous things. All of these things should be part of a Christian's life, in a sense. I know when I got saved, it was like being on cloud nine for quite a number of months. I was up, and I was feeling great. I felt like a million dollars. You know, just, a, just everything was so new, and everything I could hear, just soaking it all in. It was such a wonderful feeling. But that had nothing to do with my salvation. That had absolutely nothing to do with it. And it, so, so that's important. And, not, and, and we have a tendency to want to do those goods work. Why? Because we want to be Christ-like. Yes, that's all true. But that has nothing to do with salvations. You see, both are completely contrary to Scripture. For when we look at the Scriptures, what does the Scriptures really tell us? If we simply go to Ephesians in chapter 2 and in verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, isn't it a wonderful thing the scriptures tell us about, number one, where that comes from? It comes from God. And it comes from a love that he has for us. And how rich he is with his mercy. And how, we, and how he already loves us. And it says, even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. This verse lets us know also that, you know something? I am saved not because there's anything good about me, anything special about me. But it's all by God's grace. And that I too, as everyone, everyone born, was at one point in my life dead in sin until I came to Christ. Yes, but Christ made a way for me. And, he did, he did. and we can see that, that once I'm saved, I'm always saved if we look at verse 6. For then he says, he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in, the heaven, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This speaks of a finished work, the complete work that our Lord and Savior did on the cross for you and I. In other words, when, Jesus, when, when, when God looks at me, he sees a righteous person. He doesn't see because I'm righteous, because I'm in Christ. He sees Christ, and he sees the finishing complete work of Christ. It also tells me how, as when he looks at me, I'm already seated in the heavenlies. Therefore, it also tells me that I can't lose my salvation. Once I've been saved, I am always saved. I don't ever have to worry about that. 
And so that, that's, that's another thing. But there should be evidence in my life of that salvation as well. And then it goes on to say that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, these are the two verses most of us are extremely familiar with, but are really important, I think, for, for, from a doctrinal standpoint of understanding where we are as children of God. It says, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Most of us can quote those verses, can't we? We're familiar with those verses. But think about it for just a minute. Grace, what is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. And when we look at faith, faith is simply taking God at his word. So for salvation, it all is a, it all is a work of God. It has nothing to do with us. The only thing that, that involves us is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving that gift that he so freely offers to us. He goes on to tell us very clearly, it's not of yourselves and that it is a gift of God. Now, if I was to give a gift to my, my precious wife and I gave it to her, it is hers to do with what? Whatever she wants. Can, I have no more control over it, is it? It's a gift. It's been given to her. It's hers now, forever and ever. It, it belongs to her. I have nothing to do with it after I've given it uh, as a gift. So we understand that, that God has given, has given salvation as a gift to us. And it has nothing to do with us. That gift, she may not have earned it. Of course, she's believing she's earned it. But, uh, but anyway, someone else may not have earned it. Okay, I thought I should pick somebody else. But anyhow, given something with, with, without, any, without any deal where there was anything ever to be owed back again. You see, these are doctrinal truths that need to really be, be, be considered as, we, as, as, as a child of God that we truly understand these things. You see, this, this verse makes it very clear that salvation is by God's grace. Not of works, it is a gift of God. But if I look at verse 10, which oftentimes we don't read that verse, but we want to remember what the verse tells us. Verse 10 goes on to say, for we are his workmanship. Who's he talking about? He's talking about you if you're here as a child of God. You are his workmanship. You weren't just a number that he put in this world. He says you're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. In other words, we are to be doing good works. I'm not saved because I do good works, but I am, by God's grace, I am to be doing good works. Why? Because I'm simply a child of God. And I should be having that new nature that takes over as I've been born again, as a new creature in Christ, as, as, I, as I seek to, to follow the Lord, and I will automatically, it'll be, in my, it'll be, it'll be the natural thing for me to do, to, to do the good works, as I'm led of the Holy Spirit to do various things in this world. He has a plan for me. It goes on to say, for, for, God, for God who hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You realize that? God had a plan for you and your life before you ever were. Even before the world even was. He knew who you were going to be. He knew who I was going to be. He knew the circumstances of my life. He knew what I would do, what I wouldn't do. He knew all of these things before all of that. And God has a specific plan for me, just as he does for you. For the child of God, each life has purpose. For God has ordained that in each of our lives. These are important truths, I think, today. For thus, uh, I think as a child of God, we need to understand there's a divine purpose as a servant of God about, about how we're to be, about the Lord's business. Now, real candidly, God doesn't need you and he doesn't need me to do anything. God doesn't need anybody, does he? But what a privilege it is that God has, ha, 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 has used and continues to use someone, an old stick like me or you or whoever, for his purpose to fulfill his, his, his eternal purpose for this world and his work in this world. Yes, he has purpose for each of us. And we can earn some, we would not earn, that would be the wrong word. But the more that we do for the Lord, the more that, the more that we can, where maybe when, we, when you go before the, before, before the judgment seat and the Lord can say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Wouldn't that be great words to hear from the Lord? Wouldn't that be a great thing to hear? As a child of God, we're all going to go before that. He's going to talk about the things that we've done. 
And it goes on to teach us for the pastors and for teachers, but also, I believe, for us, just every, every day. We want to realize in 2 Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 2, it tells about how we're to be and one of the most important things about teaching and, and how we're to be as pastors and teachers specifically, but I believe as individuals as well. It tells us to preach the word, be in season and out of season. Now, we've talked about that a little bit, but how important is it to be in season? Well, in season's pretty easy, isn't it? In season is when it's easy to go out and preach and be easy to share the word of God and, and you know, kind of get the attaboys and the pat on the backs and there's no real resistance to it. And you're just the world is kind of going along. We've experienced a lot of that in, the, in this country for a lot of years. I don't know what the future holds. It may become much, much tougher. But the word of God goes on to say right here, it says, be instant in season, but out of season as well. When it gets tough, we're to still be who we are in the, as a child of God. Why? Because we can trust in Him. And we know that we can trust in Him. And it tells us, what does it, what's the Word of God going to do? Well, it's going to reprove. It's going to rebuke. And it's going to extort with all long sufferings and doctrine. You see, we want to stay true to the doctrine, to, to the truth of God's Word, no matter what. Then it goes on to say, it says, for the time will come when they will know, when they will not endure sound doctrine. Yes, the Word tells us that there's a time coming when the Word of God isn't going to be listened to. It goes on to say very clearly, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, these are those that are going to come along and, and teach, you know, maybe pull a little bit out of the Gospels here, a little bit here, a little bit there. And they're going to almost make up their own truth. But it's not going to be the whole truth. It's not going to be the truth of God's Word. It's not going to truly edify what, what, the, what the Bible truly says. They're going to heap these teachers. And they're going to walk around thinking that they are saved and they're all right and everything is good. And what they're doing is right. They're going to be able to pat themselves on the back. But that's not it. Because the Bible teaches us right here. How we need to be aware of what we need to be, we need to understand sound doctrine and understand what really the Word of God really has to say about these things. And we need to preach truth. It says in verse 4 going on there, it says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall turn to fables. How many today believe in a, in a Christ or a Jesus that is made up of their own idea of what a Jesus should be? One maybe they see as one that is a wonderful man or even a, even a God that's there for just them to take care of their own personal things in life instead of understanding that they are there as God's servant and to serve him with a whole heart. Yes, I trust that this study will, will honor him whose glory and grace are supreme and that we may boldly and accurately honor the Lord and be willing to speak the truth in season and out of season and preach truth through sound doctrine so our study we're going to begin this series with the word of god this will probably the word of god will take us probably at least two two sundays maybe more but the bible covers you know a thousand years of human history it was written by more than 40 authors we know and the bible is not just simply a collection of writings but it's one book with an amazing continuity keep in mind it's one book it's not just 66 books all put together and they kind of come up with something. But these books, as we have seen as we study the book of Daniel, how we can look in the book of Daniel, how we can look in the book of the Revelation, how we can look at uh, Jeremiah, how we can look at Isaiah, how we can look at all these different things and see how they all relate. God's truth is just opening up more and more. We see that more and more is revealed as we go through time and history as more of that Bible is put together. Yes, the Bible means one book. And we need to realize in the Old Testament particularly, but also a little bit in the New Testament, it's often referred to as the law or the law of God. And the Bible is not just a book, is it? It's not just a book. We don't want to make that mistake of thinking it's just a book. Someone will think, it's, oh, it's a great book, great book of poetry, great book of this. But rather, in fact, it is the very word of God. Remember the Lord said, no, no jot, no tittle, all of it is, is the word of God. 
And we need to realize that even though it was written by human authors over 1,600 years, it still was authored by none less than the third, the, second, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It is the Word of God. We'll look at that in a little bit further in our study. You know, we start now, now we're looking at some of the evidence concerning the Bible. I think we, can, we want to look at or consider two different sources. There's the internal evidence and the external evidence. Internal evidence is what's God, what God, what's God's Word has to literally say about itself. What does God's Word say about itself? Well, we see that, uh, we see that in literally hundreds of passages, the Bible declares itself to be the Word of God. But let us consider some of the wonders of the Bible. First is its foundation. We've already mentioned that a few times. But it literally was written over a period, a time span of almost 1,600 years. I don't know about you, but that seems like a long time to me. You know, I'm getting old, but I can't even relate to 1,600 years. Can you? 1,600 years of different men that were moved by the Holy Spirit, different times to write different parts of the Bible. We think of its unity. We think about the fact that over 40 different authors did it, and yet it's all one book. We also think of its preservation, how the Word of God has been preserved all of this time throughout all of history. And there's been many, many attempts to destroy this very Word. To take, it out of, to take it out of the world, to burn all the Bibles they could burn, to do different things as we've seen over multitudes of years. We see also its subject, its subject matter is unlike any other book and its, and its influence. And I would say not only influence, but the very power of the Word of God. There's no greater power in the world, world than, than the Word of God. Nope, there's no, there's no book like it and there never will be. For the Bible is truly a living book. It's the living word. We know from John 1.1, it says, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him and for, and, and, and for him. Uh, and without him was not anything made that was made. I don't know if you can comprehend that. That's an amazing statement. That, that verse there is the one that brought me to the Lord. It's like I had seen it and read it and understood it maybe a little bit over the years. <clears throat> but then all of a sudden one day, I saw that verse. And it was like, wow. Jesus Christ is God. That realization and that everything that is was created by him and for him. And there wasn't anything that was created that wasn't that way. And I began to understand a little bit, that light began to come on in me, of the greatness of our God. The other thing about the Bible is how it works. You see, books are about oftentimes written men to men, or you know, sometimes even a, even a book might be written about man, about God, that sort of thing. But the Bible is different because the Bible communicates, is God's communication to man, although he does at times have where men speak back to him, but we see that it actually is a, a book that has with his message, his, his purpose is revealed in it. Now we can see many things of the revelation in and of itself concerning the Bible. One is through nature, one of the verses that uh, oftentimes, but I, I really like and re can really help us to understand a lot of things concerning the Word of God, what it has to say about itself, is in Romans 1.18. I don't know if you well, might want to turn there with me this morning, Romans 1.18. We'll take a few moments, look at these verses here. These are beautiful verses to see. Romans <coughs> did that to make it easier for me I think I just made it harder okay Romans 1.18 says for <coughs> excuse me for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that when please notice 
because that when because that because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world <clears throat> are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolishness and their foolish heart was darkened what do we learn from these verses right here i think one of the most wonderful things we see first of all what god has to say concerning concerning himself we see that there is uh that he tells us how his wrath is there's going to be wrath against the ungodly and the unrighteous men who hold the truth in unrighteousness how can you hold the truth in unrighteousness if you don't know the truth we know this book is a perfect book because it's the Word of God. But he tells us right in the very next verse. It says, That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Now, there's two things that we see. We're going to look at the manifestation of what he's talking about, but also think about those words at first. It says, please notice, it says, Because that which may, which may be known of God is manifest in them. There is an innate knowledge in man of God. There's an innate knowledge. The Bible tells me so. I know in my own life, I may not have understood all, but somehow I knew that there was a God. I lived in a family where we weren't particularly religious, but I was enough about. I mean, I, could, I got a lot of external sources that I could give credit for helping me to understand that. But the truth is, God's Word says there is. There's an innate knowledge in us. Man knows that there's, that there's a God. And he's got that, just like a bird knows how to, we've talked about the bird brain, you know, it's such a big brain, you know, about that big, right? And yet that little bird can fly, he can, he can determine his friends, his enemies, he knows what to do, he does all of these things, and uh, of course mom takes him out and moves his wings up and down and kind of, you know, gets him out and walks him around a little bit. She feeds him for a little while, and typically what she does is kick him out of the nest and says, okay, it's time for you to figure out how to do things on your own, and he better fair, really quickly learn how to fly, shouldn't he? if he wants to live any time at all. But you see, he has an innate knowledge of how to fly. He has an innate knowledge of balance and what to do. He knows exactly how to take care of himself. Man is equipped with an innate knowledge of God. From the Word of God, we see that. But he goes on to even express it more when he says this. He says, He showed it unto them as well. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but, because, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, we look at that verse 20 there, and we see the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. Well, today, a lot of those invisible things aren't so invisible anymore, are they? We know about atoms, we know about DNA, we know about a whole bunch of things that nobody could ever understand. We have so much revealed to us in today's world, we can see the tremendous wisdom that goes into all of creation. We can look out into the universe at night and look and say, wow, what a wonderful, beautiful night, Check if we're in a particularly dark place. And we can really look out and enjoy that and just say how marvel, we just marvel at it. And up until about 2020, they were thinking there was about one or two billion uh, galaxies out there. That's a lot of galaxies, isn't it? You know today what they're saying, how many there are? One to two trillion. You know something, guys? Man doesn't know everything, does he? There's a little bit of difference in one or two billion and one or two trillion, isn't there? And that just happened in 20 years, they come to different conclusions. You know, man doesn't know. But God has created all of these galaxies. And, you know, we look at the Milky Way, and it's, a, it's got over 200 billion stars in just it alone. And yet they work on these perfect laws of, that God has, has for govern all of these things and how they all work together. And the tremendous energy, energy our own sun, the amount of, of, of light and heat that it puts out. Look how far away it is. And yet we're warmed this very day by it. This world is lit by it today. And it doesn't, go, it doesn't get burned, burned, burned brighter. 
And it doesn't burn less. It's consistent. The perfect orbit of our wor world, which is not a perfect round orbit, it's a little off. God has created it that way, so that it, it has, has its own purpose with its own moon. It moves the ocean. All of these things, how they all work together. The world itself, as we look at it, and we see how the world has a balance to it. What is waste in one case and another case is what? It becomes, it becomes what is used. We breathe out carbon monoxide. Trees like the carbon monoxide, and then what? They give back oxygen. Yes, Otis? You got to talk loud. I'm, I, I don't hear good. Yes, sir. Notice I totally agree with you. However, what you're saying is you won't, you won't find in the Bible anything that contradicts what I just said as far as what the Bible is, as far as what, how the world was. Now, are the greater details given as we look? For example, the, world talks, the, the Bible talks about the world, too, as being circular in one of the Psalms when they used to think the world was flat. Everything that, everything that you see over time, gets, gets proven out to be what it is. And uh, there's nothing um, uh, inconsistent about what, God's, about what God has created in, a, a, as far as the Scriptures are concerned and what we understand today, except what you just said in one sense, that where man has put his own interpretation on it and acts like he has the answers when God's Word says, no, this is what it was. But you won't find anything that says that the world was ever flat or the world is stationary. It does talk about it being the center, but it's more as a center of where the creation, he's talking about creation at, at the beginning, and in my humble opinion, huh? But I was going to say, in my humble opinion, when you, look at, uh, when you look at Genesis, what you're seeing is the very creation. Now, a lot of people won't agree with this. They call it the gap theory. I don't call it the gap theory. But there was a world and a universe before that, apparently because it was void and without form. 
And the Lord came in, he began to put this, this deal together where he brought man into the world for a specific purpose. This was after the fall of Satan, and he had a reason for that. And we are the beneficiaries of that, of that today. But all of these things just point to the glory. And let me just, um, let me just finish going a little further on with my lesson. I think you'll see this. Okay. But listen, Otis, listen to this part now. Listen to, go to Psalm 19 for me. Psalm 19 this morning. Yep. Okay, and it says in Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, To the chief musician, the Psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. What it's talking about is as, the, as you look out there, the universe is literally shouting out, in a sense, the existence of God. You know, as you look out there and you can see these things for yourself, uttering the speech, the night and the day showeth show the knowledge, and the knowledge of how all of that all works together. We marvel at it. We can't necessarily understand all of it. We can certainly marvel. It says, there is no speech or language where this voice is not heard. Nobody, no matter what language or what part of the world that you're in, looks up and doesn't see that, no matter what their language is, and have an understanding of that. It says, it goes on to say, the line is gone out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom cometh out of his chambers and rejoiceth as the strong man to run a race. Now notice, his goings forth is from end of the heavens, and his circuits round unto the end of it. And there is nothing hid from from the heat of heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect. Is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So I understand a little bit what you're saying, but that's yeah. Well, here's the key. Here's, here's the key. 6,000 years have gone past. It's an unfolding thing that the Lord has. The Word of God, it builds upon itself. I believe we're entering into the last days. These things that we're looking at right now, we're privileged because we have so much that's been given to us in this, this day and so much light that we have. But that frontier, that we're not looking for that frontier. We're not looking to go somewhere else. We're looking for the coming of the Lord. We're looking for the time the Lord is coming to set up His kingdom in this world, what He's going to do. And oh, that's a whole different story. That's a, that's a whole di- And I agree with you. That's because they're lost. They don't understand. The Bible, calls it, the Bible tells, tells us that they're actually foolish. They don't comprehend the Word of God. Yes, yeah, the Bible teaches us that. But God still rules and overrules. Yes, He is. He is the prince and the power of the air. The Bible tells us that. But God still rules and overrules in the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, all of that. We're in it.
Let me just suggest something to you. If you'll take a little, take, take back and look, look through history. History, it's a horrible place, the world. Wars, torture, all the stuff that's gone on all before even us. And the, the Bible tells us that is all real. And it's all going to be like that. We've talked about a lot of that in our study of Daniel. But what you want to understand is, is God is ultimately in control and his perfect plan is being re, un, unfolded. And we are, I believe, of course, we're certainly a day closer to his coming. Exactly, that's true. Okay, okay so i got to go off the lesson now, okay? Because we're almost out of time, all right? Okay, but I'm going to go ahead and figure this out. We're going to go ahead and go from here. But the, in verse 8, eight here of, of Psalm 19, it says, The status of the Lord, the, the statues of the Lord are what? Right. They're always right. Rejoice. Rejoice the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure. Enlighten the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And more to be desired than than that of gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is a great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from the secret faults, keeping back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let not them have dominion over me, then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great trans transgression. Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In this psalm, just a couple of quick things. We see in first the first part, the creation, the crea the the the, the, uh, the creation as it, as shows the actual glory of God, which we just touched on. We see the excellence of the divine law in verse seven. And we see David's prayer for grace in, seven, in, in, the, uh, in verse 12. Now, the second thing we want to look at is, is the providential dealings in Romans. For example, in Romans 8, the Bible tells us we know that all things, so we can be confident, no matter what, what's going on in this world right now, the Bible tells us all things work together for them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. If you are here today as a child of God, you know the Lord, we know that we have purpose. We see from God that not only do we have a purpose, but that he has made us a promise. And that is that, 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 that he's going to, uh, that, that we know that all things are going to work together for good. And so therefore, we know that we can be confident and know that all things are going to work together for good that if we just simply will trust God and know that all of this is part of his divine plan. We want to remember as children of God does death or sin have any power over you today? Huh? You can surrender to sin, but, you, but it has no power over you, does it? Because Jesus Christ took care of that upon the cross. So we have nothing to fear. Death is nothing for us to fear. We see that. And then it says, through the preservation of the universe. We just talked about that part. But in Colossians 1.15, it goes on to say, who? Christ, this is Christ. Is, uh, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And then in verse 16, please notice, please notice what it says. It says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him literally all things consist. So we know that all things are of him. You know, I told you about the universe and those sort of things. And then through miracles, we know this as well. We know that miracles also testify that as our Lord did that, to, as he did that to manifest that who he was, uh, that he is the Son of God. In John 2, 2, 11, we says, Thus the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifest forth his glory, and his disciples at that point could believe upon him. And we're going to go ahead and close there because I'm really about out of time here. Uh, yeah. I have this little paper in my book, in okay. my Bible, that I've had for many, many years. 
Uh huh. Yes. And I just want to read this. It was written uh, years ago. Can everybody hear her? It was written by a lady, Priscilla Howe, and it says this, the Bible. This book contains the mind of God, yes. the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. <clears throat> Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Amen. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly. Frequently, prayerfully, it is the mind, it is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life. It will be opened at the judgment, and it will be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility. It will reward the greatest labor, <coughs> and condemn all who trifle with its sacred content. Amen. Amen. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, with that, we're going to need to go ahead and close. And Brother Norman, would you close this morning, please, brother?